All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Low Code Campfire for Friday, June 24, 2022. This is episode number 56. Uh, I am Dale Warner, head of, head of support for Plant and App, and um, I'm happy that you're here joining us today. Let's see. This is an event we do every week, Fridays this, this hour, 10 a.m. Central Time, where we get together and talk about shared techniques, challenges, experiences. This is an all skill levels uh, welcome event, but uh, it's, all, it's a very useful group. We get together and um, discuss issues and solve problems. All these uh, episodes are recorded on our YouTube channel on the uh, uh, there's a QR code there for it, but it's youtube.com slash plant an app. And uh, you'll want to look for the low code campfire channel. We do a pretty straightforward agenda. It's pretty informal. We say hello, do introductions, and then in no particular order, we'll, well, first call is always first. So we'll do first call and then uh, we'll talk about other things like things in our campfire website, uh, feature requests, submitted topics, which we don't have any uh, prepared ones this week, ghost stories, and then at, uh, at the end of an hour or so, we'll go to Afterglow, we turn off the recording, and you can hang around and, depending on your time zone, have an adult beverage. Um, we're not providing that, by the way. The, we uh, pro have pretty straightforward guidelines, uh, be nice, and if you've got noise going on behind you, please mute. You can submit questions and topics in advance or provide feedback on how the host is doing with his hosting duties. You use that quick QR code or it's in the emails that we send to you. So with that, hello all, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning everyone. I am broadcasting from an undisclosed location today. <laughs> so I had to change my background to, uh, to an appropriate background. Um, and actually, yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the Gulf coast of uh, Texas today. Anyone else traveling? I'm in a theater shop right now. You see the fancy lights and some stuff on the shelves behind me. Uh, when I'm not building websites for people, uh, I'm the president of our local community theater and I'm, uh, putting a big show together, The Sound of Music. So we have a number of things happening today. And so I got in early so I could be doing uh, the campfire from here and then um, uh, shut down and get over there and start putting a set together. Well, good. I don't know if you need any uh, 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 extras but or actresses, but I, can you even say actresses anymore? Actors. Uh, I know there's people on the call that know people, so. Oh, that's good to know. We might have maybe a bit of a commute to the Chicagoland area for some, but yeah, but it'd be yeah. fun. Love and Don, we should, we should we should talk sometime. I have a long history in community theater. Oh, no kidding! Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Let's <laughs> do that. I didn't know. Yeah, cool. I traded my uh, beautiful backdrop of uh, a nice view for my office. <laughs> <laughs> I see we have things to talk about in a little while. All right. Um, so with that, I am going to move right on to first call. If anybody's got topics that are uh, um, immediate plant and app, low code projects, questions, what, what's first call, what's on your mind? I'd like to jump in, Dale. Jerry here. I, uh, hey, um, a couple things and uh, unfortunately I have to go a little quick today so I just want to I want to pose this out for thought um, two things one um, Matt Croshaw can't be here today and he had put in a tech support call about the drag and drop feature on the uh, listing module and, and I had he was trying to implement my code on his and we found that a late the uh, non legacy view of the listing the drag and drop was not performing as we expected. Um, hopefully somebody can give that a look at when they feel like it, but it's a, uh, if you basically are dragging an item up the listing, the uh, token, the previous token is not reporting back what we're hoping to see. And uh, my code that you had had me install for us on a contribution at one point was uh, 
so you could sort the grid. You know, you can you can drag and drop things inside the grid, and it would automatically sort the data table behind it, and uh, works fine in legacy view, but not in whatever we call the non-legacy view. Bootstrap right? five. Bootstrap five, and uh, so again, I, I don't really expect any comments on that on this call, but just be aware if you are trying to drag and drop and do some coding in there and you're on the bootstrap five version, your frustration levels might climb up thinking that you're doing something wrong when in fact you're not. It's, and uh, so there's that. So yeah, well, before we move on, I, I saw that, um, I, I can't remember whether it's a ticket or on, on the community forum, but regardless, we, that did get reported and uh, I have reported it to development. It's a, um, it is definitely a Bootstrap 5 issue, and it's kind of fun when you're dragging one way, it works. I think down works and up doesn't. Yeah, exactly. But, um, uh, that um, almost certainly is an issue with our implementation of Bootstrap 5. Um, because what happens just, I mean, at, at a, that the interface does a nice job of letting you drag things around, but the kind of behind the scenes thing that happens is that you get the, a, a, a variable reported to you when the event happens that tells you where it was dropped, uh, the, mm -hmm. the row above where you were dropped. It's called the previous um, row. And so the, right. the technique that Jerry had put together was when, uh, when it gets dropped, we, we get the idea of the previous row and then a, a nice script that does renumbering that, uh, so that we have a, a numerical sequence and then you, uh, you cause the grid to sort on that. And, and so like magic, when you drag things around, things stay where you put them. In this case, then they don't go where you put them because the number that it's reporting is wrong. And so that's very annoying. We're, uh, I, I've reported it. Very good, very good. Um, my second thing I wanted to bring to light was, um, I'm gonna try my best to pronounce his name probably, but he's on the call with us now, uh, Don Gingold as, was asking me to assist him with our contribution of our maps program that we did some time ago. And he discovered that on the contribution page, the maps example is not running. It's yes. not displaying the map. Right. I went to my development system and you're probably way ahead of me, Dale, but sure oh. enough on my, uh, on my uh, development system, which is absolute latest and greatest PAA, it's not displaying my maps either. But on my real application, which is running PAA 1.16, free bootstrap five, runs like a charm, everything's going along fine. I'm suspicious that something between our bootstrap five and, and our Google Maps is not playing nicely together. Just wanted to bring that out. If you're trying to implement maps on a late, late, late version of PAA, you might be disappointed as well. And uh, I'm trying to work through and see what I can find on my end as to why that's not working, but it's, it's, and I don't know exactly where it changed, but I'm suspicious up around 1.19 of PAA when we, we shifted, maybe, maybe something in there disturbed that, but you, you could look on the contributions page and see for yourself down, maybe play with it when you have time. Yeah. Uh, and nobody has converted that and uh, nobody's touched it as far as I know. So it's still bootstrap three. I am suspicious as you that something we call this release induced prior, something that uh, <laughs> work doesn't work now. And it's just because we did a release. So I, I, th I suspect something uh, that, that you rely on changed and, um, uh, and I, I have it on my list to look at. I haven't had time on that. No worries. Okay. When, and, uh, when Don and, asked about it, actually. So. Yeah. So uh, I'll be glad to jump in and help Don complete his mission, uh, just depending on how and when and where we, we make sure the PAA is behaving. The rest of it, I think, is pretty simple stuff for me to do for him. Oh. Um, yeah. That's I, all I got. Yeah, well, good stuff. Good. <laughs> and you know, uh, for, for the record, I do try very hard. I have I'm up to about 75 tests of the real world scenarios that you guys submit. I keep up on the side and and uh, uh, run against our new versions and try to make sure that all the old stuff works. But Maps was one that I did not have on on my list. So 
Uh, we'll try and do a better job of that. No worries. Uh, if I may piggyback on that, uh, some, some rather generic questions for everybody, but they pertain to this project that I'm on with the maps. And thank you, Jerry, for writing back and uh, offering to help. I really appreciate that. Uh, I did look through what was going on, and uh, it, it appears that what, and this is something I never thought to do, is that you're using uh, the form, and in the form, you got a static uh, uh, field. And in the static field, the content is your call to Google Maps, which is wild. Uh, never thought to do anything like that. Um, but uh, what I was wondering is uh, the use of my tokens. So the my tokens module, I have, I'm new to uh, a lot of this. So I usually use action forms uh, going way back, but just pretty basic forms. Uh, and these uh, 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 periphery type of uh, fringe type of applications of it uh, are, are kind of new to me. So my thought was, um, would you be able to use my tokens to generate a token? So you put that on the page first. And in that my tokens, you make a call to your database, you get all of your latitude, longitude information in a, um, in a set of tokens, uh, and then uh, use just an HTML module uh, that uh, because I think my tokens works in an HTML module and drop your calls to Google Maps in there. Would that also work, or do you need to have um, Action Form do some additional work uh, that my tokens wouldn't do? That's my first question. Well, if you allow me to answer that real quick, I can tell you your your idea will work just fine until the day comes that you want to interact with the map, and by that I mean maybe you want to. In your email, you you kind of implied that you want to select a job location or select something and have the map dynamically change on you. An HTML form um, is not going to easily allow you to put buttons in places and call the actions required to do that. And so, for an example, um, I use Action Form because it's my one-stop place to design a screen with an embedded map with buttons on it that might do exactly like you do. Uh, and I'll use your example. I have a drop down with job locations, maybe. And when I change from job locations, the map will just dynamically change on the screen. That becomes super, super, super sophisticated and easy when you're using our action form modules to do it. That okay. Way. Got um, it. You've just got a static map or a map that's going to query data and display it onto a page and it's not going to interact with the user. The HTML module, along with my tokens, is a super way to do it. Um, uh, cool. But it's probably not any more efficient than just putting an action form on the page and having all that robust uh, toolbox at your fingertips. I see. It allows you to do other things. So that's a shortcut. And um, if you don't know, there was a video created on the day that I did the example for maps oh. in our um, in our YouTube channel for Planet App. I'm sure one of us can find that link to that. And paste it in the chat today. And if you go back and rewatch that, it's it's a it's about a forty five minute long tutorial of just kind of what we did to make that contribution page work. And uh, there's probably some pretty healthy knowledge for you there too. Oh, that's okay. perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. All right. Uh, the second question: the uh, uh, Google Maps uh, and Google Places fields uh, in Action Forms. So. Um, I went and hunted for whatever documentation there was on that uh, to try to understand the, the way to use it. And the Google Places sounds perfect. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have businesses come to the website and say, hey, I'm a business, I've got jobs, uh, and I've got a couple of different locations. So I'm going to uh, let them uh, click a button that says add a location. They're going to type it in. Google Places field will find that information, pass me back the JSON string, right? Uh, I, I just said all that like I know what I'm talking about. Um, the JSON string, first of all, when I am doing it in uh, 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 testing this out and playing with it, I'm uh, changing the fields that are in the um, I'm changing the options that are in the Google field um, and uh, like changing it from mixed to geocode, et cetera. And then below that, there's things that are being uh, specific pieces that are being passed. So 
number one, I don't know if this is a bug report or I'm doing something wrong or I need to do something and tell me if, what it is, but um, I'm changing those things. And then when I run the test, I get the exact same amount. So when I first tried it using the default settings, I got the, the uh, uh, official address and the geo codes. And then when I changed it and did a few other things, I got a whole bunch of stuff. And then when I changed back to just the originals, it still gives me the whole bunch of stuff. So it's not like clearing it out. Is there a cache issue or something like that? Or uh, is, there a, is there a problem, I guess? So one thing to report. But um, what do I do with that? Because I, I, I started with creating a locations table using entities and said, okay, well, where do I put this? Because I'm getting back this long string of characters um, with the squiggly brackets and the locations and all of that stuff. Do I need to parse it and put it in individual pieces? It seems like the Google Places, uh, sorry, the Google Maps module would take all of that in as input. So, am I? Uh, do I do I need to parse it, put it into pieces, and then on the on the other page where I display it? break it all or, or build it all back together again? Yeah, okay, great question, Don. And and much of what you're asking, I will be glad to help you on private sessions. Uh, it's oh, okay. a bit beyond the scope of to describe everything, but I will tell you in theory, um, you're going to build your entity and yes, we are going to grab a response from Google and we're gonna parse it down to just the pieces you need write those to your SQL table. And then when it comes time to display the map, we're gonna query that SQL table, bring those pieces back in and formulate them back together in such a way that Google Maps can read it and plot your pen points onto the map. That's Got the it. theory. Uh, I wish it was that simple. I do wanna ask one thing, um, you know, Action Form has a Google Maps field mm -hmm. and it's one of the data types for a field description, if you will. and I am not using that in any way, shape, or form. That right. is something that, that I believe was designed to just very easily allow a, 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 a no-coder person to plot a place on a map, a place, a single place. And kind of like you're going to put your own <laughs> business, this is where I am, okay? And, and you put that like on the Contact Us or the About Us page or something like that. To do what you're trying to do to create that type of dynamic stuff, we're going to be making server calls, server requests to Google. And we're gonna be using the JavaScript that you've seen Google supply us in HTML modules and or uh, static text boxes in action form. We're gonna be using SQL Server to store what we want, keep what we want and recall that and reformat that back into the proper strings that allows Google to, to query that out. I, I wish it was magic, um, it's not, <laughs> but- it really if you go back to, I mean, the 45 minute video that you talk about, you really have, have boiled it down to something that's very reusable. And, you know, in, in, uh, I, I would argue that being, being able to use low code to really create something like this in a morning, if you know what you're doing, I mean, it's incredible, but it, it, it is a hard topic. Uh, Don, I've pasted that YouTube on the chat channel. Uh, so I would definitely advise that you watch that. I think it'll, if, if nothing else, it'll help you um, understand exactly what, what Jerry just said. And then when you guys have a conversation, you'll be like up to speed or, or have, have your questions. Um, Perfect, thank you. He, he explained it in a, in a very uh, um, a, a very straightforward, practical way. And I think, and, and reusable, since we have it on Campfire, on the Campfire website, if it only worked, <laughs> you'd be able to see exactly how to do it. Here's the formula, here, you know, do it. But follow that and then, yeah, that, that way it'll be uh, uh, real efficient when you do get a hold of Jerry. Got it. Well, the, the answer about parsing was that little missing nugget that I needed. So that's perfect. And then I'll go watch the video and understand, uh, you know, the, the, the steps that you took. I got it in concept. Perfect, thanks. Awesome. And don't hesitate to reach out to me for further help. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, and there again, that's what I just love about this group, both for uh, this interactive being able to uh, share in advance as these, because we, we all come up with these things one at a time, right? Um, you know, you weren't ready. Don wasn't ready to deal with maps when we were presenting it, but now it comes around. So, you know, it's, it's great that we have this. And then 
uh, I, I don't remember who it was, but there was a, a great answer on community that I didn't have, I, I hadn't gotten to yet. So I love it when I get into community, when somebody's posted a question and uh, the, the, the great answer is already there. So I, I appreciate the way you guys help each other. What else is on first call? Well, I've got a couple of first call questions. Good. <clears throat> Because I don't have any second ask, ask. call stuff, so <laughs> you're you're uh, you're going too far. A couple, <laughs> That's a couple too many. I know. <laughs> Does that make a first call and a second call? Can I sure. put the two questions together and and <clears throat> is there a uh, an XML file upload function that when it, when the XML is coming from a file? I found XML. Uh, actions that can where you can paste it in but i couldn't find a way to point it to a file and say load this file in i don't know about anyone else but i'm a little i was a little confused on that one what do you mean by an xml upload so i have i have a file sent to me by a vendor that's in an xml format and the um I need to, I want to import it like I would import a CSV file, but. Oh, okay. So you want to parse the data in the XML to be able to insert it into a, an entity or a table? Yes. Yeah. And I, I found actions that say convert XML, but they all look like they, you, you copy and paste that XML in or take I it from a web request. I think you're looking for single file upload. Um, I, I can bring that, well, no, that, that'll, that'll upload the file, but he wants to actually take the data within that file and actually import it into a table. Right, but um, I'm saying if, after you do single file upload, there you can, you can use actions against that. Um, but I, I couldn't find an action that would allow me to read that file in, in an XML format. Yeah, I don't believe there is a plant and app built in action that's going to read XML for you. However, SQL does offer you the ability to parse XML. So what you could do is um, it'd be like a multiple step because I've done this in the past. You can write a my token and if you need, I can supply it to you that would read the contents of a file, supply it as a parameter to a SQL statement and then have the SQL statement parse the XML as you need, and then you can insert them into your table that way. It's okay. kind of a roundabout way of doing it, but there's no uh, easy action to parse and import XML. You'd have to do that manually. Okay. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing that token, that would be great. And then my, my, my yeah, second... I was... I, I was just going to say, sorry to interrupt, Jim. Uh, my mistake when I, I was thinking XLS when uh, in, in, in my first example, I think you know Ben is right on track here. So my my second related question was the in doing the single file upload, um, there's a file path parameter that lets you point to where you're going to upload the file. Is and if you put a token in there, it'll read the token, but my single file upload is in a um, in a form where I'm picking parameters of what kind of file it is and things. Is there a way to read the read the form and pass the token into the single file upload path before you actually upload it? That there's a good confusing question. Um, Mind if I jump in on that one too? Please. <laughs> um, my first thought is you would have to do a multi-step form. So you would have to have whatever your form items are that you select first. Once you select all of those items and you click next, then bring you to, you know, an area or re you're going to have to reload the page with those parameters potentially like in a query string or in a cookie or something like that, that you would then read back at the next load and then put that into your path. Because it, since 
that control only reads the information at the time it loads, you're not going to be able to do it dynamically. You'd have to force another load of that form so that it reads the correct path that you want to dump the file into. Because okay. the file upload happens, I believe, right when you choose the file. It sends it out. Yeah, it looks, it, it, it definitely, when you click on the action to, you know, you pick the file and click upload, it seems to appear before or happen before everything else um, in the action stack. So, yeah, but that, that makes sense to me. I just, you know, this is one of those questions where there's so much knowledge in this group that you go, oh, I've been doing this wrong for all these years. Uh, I, will, I will do the multi-step. The day you stop learning is the day you should worry. That's right. All right. Thank you. I don't know if that was two or one. But I'll, I'll take it off my hand. I think it's one with a follow up, Jim. Okay. Mm -hmm. And seriously, there is no, there is no uh, additional topics uh, prepared. So, whatever, wherever you guys want to go today, it's all good with me. I want to go to Vegas. I'll meet you there. What's your, never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll see for after. We'll. We just need to go wherever Dale is. He always ends up at nice beaches. Okay. Um, yep. David, I, I am. Got, go ahead. I got something, uh, just a comment. So yesterday uh, I was in the, the new My Token editor. Yes. And um, it, it looked like a token hadn't got moved from dev to production. So something was airing. And so I copied in the new one, click save, and my stuff still wasn't working, went back in, and it hadn't saved. So I figured I did something stupid, so I pasted it in again, click save, still didn't save. So I went into the old My Token editor, pasted it in there, and click saved, and it was fine, um, and everything worked. So I thought I'd just make that comment, because I know the, well, the old token well, editor is going away in the next version. And so it's funny you said worried. that. I noticed that same exact behavior today, actually. At least, I don't know about your case, but in my case, if there was an error in the script, it just, it looks like it saves, it exits out, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't save nothing. It doesn't show you an error. It just bails right out. Because that was now, I was copying and pasting, so I don't think I would have had an error. I, I'll say it was, a, it was a SQL token, so maybe there's something with that, but... Um, I mean, I just copy what worked in dev, paste it into production, click save. And so I would have done the same thing in the, in the other one. Um, so, so just, yeah. for, just for clarity for me, are you, were you creating it by using import and export or were you actually recreating the token in the. The token was already in production. It was just uh, a new column was getting added to the SQL query essentially. And so it was already there. I just went in and edited it and paste it in the new SQL statement and click the uh, whatever it is, save and close or something like that. Yep. And uh, it didn't save. And so um, I would just say a couple of things. One is we're always interested in, in knowing when something, I mean, absolutely correct. We're, we are, we have announced that um, the old interface for my tokens is going away, that we want to make sure the new one is good and reliable. So what version you're using and exactly what you were trying to do, uh, I would love to be able to make sure that we can reliably do that. Sure. Uh, I, would, I would also, you know, suggest the possibility. Um, I mean, the experience that you had shouldn't happen. So I'm not trying to minimize that, but you, um, the import function, export import functionality, um, might have revealed more. Maybe it still wouldn't have worked. Maybe it would have given you the error. I don't know. But uh, anyone who who um, who can reliably reproduce this bug, get in touch with me, please, because I'd like to get it in front of a developer. Well, you could test it. Well, at least my version, you could test real quick by if you, for argument's sake, create a Razor script and don't put like the code end code. Just leave it blank or put you know, REMS or anything in there, it will just bail out. It won't save and it won't give you an error. All right, well, so here we are, we're in campfire, we create a token. It's a, 
error save token, definition, razor. So what should I put here? Yeah, if you just hit save right now, you would think you would get some sort of error. Yep, so it doesn't look like it didn't save, but it didn't, uh, yes. So the error should, there's no error message popping up when it has an yeah, error. Yeah, and well, at least, uh, uh, when I did it, for some reason, it actually, it did it close out? Maybe it didn't, I don't remember. I thought it saved, because I just assumed it saved, but it didn't, and then, you know, I moved out, went to test it or something like that, and it just wasn't working, and I'm like, wait, what's going on? Great feedback. I will uh, put this on my list of things to report. I I, th I think I mean in this case it's just we I think it needs an error message. Script can't save because whatever. Um, do you agree? Agreed. As long as a, a message popped up to let you know, but it was just a little deceiving because I just assumed it saved. So potentially you could have that. A, a real and David, you know, you your said yours was a um, was a sequel. Mine was a sequel. I'm. It was the morning, so I hadn't been drinking yet. So I'm pretty sure the sequel was was good sequel. Yeah, fair enough. Well, if you can reproduce it, I'd love to uh, to see that. Sure. Okay. Good. I am. Trying to navigate with a touchpad today. I forgot my mouse and it's painful to watch. I apologize. <laughs> um, what else? I have another newbie question, if that's okay. Oh, sure. All righty. Um, it has to do with uh, permissions for a user who is uh, adding records and, and viewing records. So, uh, and uh, if I understand correctly, um, it sounds like uh, Action Forms or Action Grid is doing some magic after I uh, say the you know the filtering that I want. Um, that was a strange introduction, but let me explain it a little bit clearer. Um, so I, I create a small table, and there's a status field in the table, and I want the uh, user when they come back and they look a, at a list of entries that they've put in. So they created the record. So um, then now they look at it and I just want them to see a list of uh, items that have been approved. So status equal approved, so something like that. So in the, in the, the source, I say, I want you to go to the table um, uh, of these records and show me just what's been approved. But of course, this table includes a whole bunch of different users' records. So all I need to do is worry about the where status equals approved and action form or action grid automatically, automatically uh, uh, only shows me those records that are approved and created by that person. So just to help me level set on this one, are you using Plant and App entities or your own database tables? Uh, plant and app entities. Okay. Uh, and so the data source for your listing is the um, the entity data source. Yes. Okay. So in those in in that case, the um, the entity is going to apply um, the security. Okay, cool. That's kind of what yeah. I thought I was going to do. Yeah, you're uh, when essentially when you use an, an NT as the data source, then all these permissions come into play. When you're using, if you use SQL, you can, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. <laughs> right. It's up to you to figure out uh, what security you're going to apply and what you're going to do because SQL goes around all of our security. Uh, it, it, the cool. security is built into the, to the entity. But if you, if your data source for this is the book entity, you know, for a listing, it's, it's not going to let it, if, if this says, um, um, 
you know, no use, no, all users have no view permissions, then um, users that are not authenticated or it, the listing will automatically, as you say, not include that for them. Um, So are, are you running into any issues with that or are you just making sure you understand it? Making sure I understood it. Good, yep. Um, yeah. A lot of the times it's just, you know, it's, it's all stewing in your head before you start actually coding it. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm probably, you know, worrying about nothing before jumping in and trying it. Yep. But now that you've said that it's gonna work that way, I have a little more confidence, just gonna jump in and. Try. Did you, did you happen to uh, see our low code cafe yesterday or Wednesday? No, I couldn't make it. Okay. Well, that one uh, I, I took the, the whole topic was what can you do as a no coder? And if you hang around to the end of that, I did get into creating some security and seeing the, uh, uh, the impact of that. So, uh, so setting some permissions and then you actually log in as that kind of a user and see what happens. And so you get a different result based on who you are. So there's uh, that, and I'm sure some other videos that, that we've done. I don't know, Patrick, you might have one that, that you can point people to. Patrick, uh, yeah, still here, um, about security. But that's, uh, yep, it should work as, as expected. And um, you, you, Touch on another thing too, though, that our automatic, um, the things that are generated automatically as a result of creating entities do build some role things into the form. So it's kind of two levels. Um, uh, the things that we build for you automatically, um, for example, will test your role and not offer you the new button if you don't have the right to add them. Um, and then when it comes time to actually doing the database work, it will check your role at that point and say, do, does this person have the right to create a new record? So the, the point to that is that uh, in, in our, if you were to use the things that are created automatically by Planton app, it's kind of gonna do the, the right thing in the first place. It won't offer you the option so it doesn't fail on the save. If you're writing your own form to do data entry and you're not paying attention to the roles, you're just giving every user the ability, for example, to enter a new record, it's gonna fail at the point when they try to write to the table. You know, when, Got they, it. when they create a new book, it's gonna fail. So it's kind of multiple layers that we build in there, but at the core, it's at the database. I thought it would be a good idea to take advantage of some of the uh, fields that are already built in. Yep. And uh, the first of all, the um, uh, doing the the search on just you know status equals approved and not worrying about what other records they might see because it's already built in is one thing. Uh, but the created by uh, user uh, is a is, it seems like a simple way of linking several different entities together. Uh, because uh, that person would be creating the business, they'd be creating the location, and they'd be creating the jobs. So that's how I could link all three of those entities together without um, um, and, and just using the field that's there rather than uh, throwing other fields in there to do the linking. Mm -hmm. Quite potentially. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. So... Um... Out of curiosity, when you said that you have a status of approved or not, things like that, are you um, uh, are you using a text field that says approved, or are you using our uh, a linked entity? Um, I've uh, I've tried it both ways, actually. I, well, I I have tried it where there's an entity of different statuses, different states, uh -huh. and uh, and then dropped in the uh, uh, a field of that entity type um, yes. to do it that way. And then um, I haven't really figured out how to, uh, how to use that, uh, like in a where clause or, you know. Uh, well, and that's exactly the reason that I, that I bring it up. When you do a, uh, when you use an entity that's linked, what's actually getting stored in your, um, in, in your 
database is going to be the ID of the linked record. So in order to do a where clause, uh, you need to know that approved, for example, has an ID of two. And so your where clause would be where status equals two. You can't say where status equals approved. Uh, right, right, exactly. It, that's, uh, um, we didn't really go into uh, the episode that I was just talking about really to kind of shows both of those methods. It starts out by putting a text field in and then converting it over to a uh, type of, I didn't actually show the where clause stuff, but it, it, will, it will kind of start to get you there. Got it. Good. What else? Uh, I Dale, I have a, a question I'm hoping uh, <clears throat> might get some guidance with. I'm working on a project where I have a, um, a kind of like an intranet site with where physicians can go to and it has all their information and it's more for physician to physician so they can learn more about each other and contact each other through their best possible way. Um, and what I'm tasked to do is to try to streamline the updating of the physicians as they are either leaving or if um, or they're being added to the system. And um, they've provided us with an API and it will bring back several you know, records. And what I'm tasked to do is, is to basically merge the two together and only certain fields because the, the data that I'm getting from the API is basically like a, a front facing website where the, where the data is public. And so I'm only updating public kind of information on the intranet side, but I'm not familiar with how to, when I get the API and there are like probably going to be about 400 records, how to parse through them. Cause some of them have sub arrays in them like languages uh, and mm -hmm. in the in the database that i have on the internet side those are basically just a one field that's just put in a string so you have you know spanish comma you know uh, tagalog and so, so on and so forth and so i'm trying to figure out what's the best way to you know parse through all the data and then handle the the sub arrays to get it to how it matches with what's in the kind of like the, the intranet site database. And so I didn't know if there's a, the best approach to take to that. Well, so at a high level, um, the, um, the converting, um, using lists to do the thing. Ah. Jim, Jim has the answer. Uh, let's, let's do it first, and, and I'll, we'll go from there. Um, well, I, I'm not sure I have the answer. We've we've had a similar we we've had similar types of things. Um, are you needing to process all of the records that are coming back to you, or are you having to filter them out first? No, we're gonna. We don't need to filter them out. They're going to be only active physician so then I know that what I what I'm receiving from the API is the latest and greatest members in this in this particular uh, group so what I need to do is on my end I need to either uh, merge the, that those that exist delete that those, those don't that don't are no longer there and then up you know uh, and add the new ones basically yeah um, so, sorry the, the way we had it so we've had us the way we've done that with a similar um, situation is to um, rather like Ben's point about XML is to lean on um, SQL Server because SQL, the modern, you know, the current versions of SQL Server can ingest JSON. So you can you can dump the JSON into into um, SQL as as tables and then do a merge, but not a, yeah, a merge statement. So uh, we would have a process that ran every night. But um, yeah, first, it, well, it cleans out the it cleans out the temporary table, um, then loads from the API into this into this temporary table, 
and then does a merge between the temporary table and the one that's driving the, uh, driving the plant and app site. And because it's a merge, you can then say, um, these are the points that match, these are the records you'll update. If, if one exists in the other, you know, if, if this record exists in my live production um, database or table, but doesn't exist in the API table, then delete it from my production one or add it. Uh, it does rather depend on how clean your JSON is. And we have had situations where the J JSON doesn't play well. Uh, you mentioned that if it's with languages, you'll get a subarray. Even if someone, someone has one language, is it, a, um, is it still in a, um, in a child array? Or do they sometimes, is it sometimes an, an, a, a, an array element? or is it sometimes a single value because that can throw you off a bit? We found that's yep. the best way to deal with large numbers of records rather than doing something with actions where you're stepping through record by record. Okay. Yeah, I, I did look into that where you, like you said, parse the JSON through, through SQL, but the, I guess the part that I guess I don't have a lot of knowledge in is this to how do you handle this? You know, how do I combine the sub arrays and how do you know how many are in the sub array to be able to kind of create the string, to string them along into one? Um, I guess I wasn't able to find any yeah. information that showed me yeah. how to do that. Yeah, yeah um, I think if I remember right, the way we did that was um, we, kept, we kept the sub array, it depends, it depends Depends how many steps you want to go through. We would keep the we keep the sub arrays as a as a column, and then and then in a second step in the stored procedure, go through that that col that column of the which had the the JSON array, and then transform that into another into another column which is comma separated. So it turns the JSON array into just a comma a comma separated value. Okay. All right. Uh, I have to it's look into that. It's, it's, when it, it's when they start getting deep, or you, they, there is a lot of variation between between the uh, individual elements that you get yeah. into trouble, and then you have to step through um, record by record, typically. Yeah, as far as I know, that that's probably the, the furthest down it'll it will ever go. It's just the languages. There's one with offices, but then that's just basically a list of offices that these doctors may practice at hmm. and that's about it yeah so you don't have nested nested you know a child of a child of a child or anything silly like that. nothing that no nothing that's that goes down that that deep yeah yeah well, I, it's I, I very, say, yeah very basic yeah yeah so i i would say as you're wanting to process all 400 odd every every time you might find that's the best way of doing it best way of doing it. okay yeah, because that's what I hope to do is just put it on a, in a, you know, a schedule that runs once a month. It doesn't really need to be done that frequently every day because they don't, you know, not much changes. So, but, okay, uh, I'll go down that route and, and do it that way. Yeah, if, if, if I can help, give me a shout. Okay, I will. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jim, thank you. So, uh, Jim, I appreciate you stepping in, especially because uh, you jump right to the idea of, of do, doing things in large volume and, and efficiently. And I was going, uh, I, I have a tendency to go to the record by record and brute, brute force kind of thing. So that's a, that's a really great perspective. So our, um, in, the, in the brute force record by record area, um, putting things in lists allows you to iterate through them. And uh, then, then you get into, um, for example, when you have subarrays, then you can use a, a, a list again. So converting that into a list that you then iterate through, it's, it's um, again, more brute force. So the more records you have, the, the less uh, attractive doing it uh, that way is. And, and perhaps it's far more elegant in the first place to use what, what Jim suggested. Okay. Yeah, um, you're, what, yeah, what you were saying, Dale, is what the route I was probably going to be heading towards, but um, they were still trying to figure out how to do the, you know, parsing, I guess, the sub areas, I guess, how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've done, we've, we've, we've done both. Um, we're synchronizing the CMS, not CMS, the CRM. Um, we've, 
we, ha we have a process which runs through and creates a list. And if there are subarrays, it creates another list and goes, goes down and down. That, we found that that was quite difficult to debug and to, um, and to check and to, to work with just the, way, just the way it's written. I think partly it may be to do with um, familiarity with SQL um, compared to with the uh, compared to with the, the other tools, but we did. It, when you're dealing with um, subarrays that may or may not be there, it can get a bit mind bending with your um, your actions nested within actions within actions, and having to keep track of where where things are. So um, mm. it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can't do it that way. But we did find it was certainly more more difficult to test. And, um, and validate. Yeah. Yeah, and I like things the simplest, the best. It, it makes it easier for everybody. <laughs> it's a definition of simplicity. Really. <laughs> Patrick, it looks like you have an opinion. Well, I was just going to say. I mean, and, and it's a it's a a simpler approach, and you know, may uh, it may or may not work for you. But we do have, um, and, and maybe you're familiar with it, but the parse JSON into tokens action available to you that um, when you do when you use that action with with your JSON you can map um, into uh, sub arrays uh, to some degree it's not perfect but it uh, it, it um, for something that's not too overly complex there is that potential there um, so that you can then take your after you parse into JSON you parse your JSON into tokens then you can uh, you can actually uh, um, create tokens from that parsing that will go down into uh, sub arrays to to pull the values out um, so that's there's potential there as well okay is there so, an is there an example of that on uh, any of the videos or anything yeah yeah YouTube I think we video? have quite a few um, uh, a few weeks ago, I did one in a low-code cafe um, that uh, I can send. And uh, Dale, do you know another one? Uh, no, I was going to. Well, there are other examples, and I, I was going to just bring up kind of one more, one more tool that you could consider. Or um, if your strong suit is uh, is JavaScript. I think we had a great example of, uh, I think both Radu and, and maybe someone else had done this, where um, you can parse the, uh, you can go into, uh, use, use a JavaScript library to go through and parse out exactly what you need. Um, so yeah, it really depends kind of on what your first language is, right? Uh, if um, using, you could do it with, with SQL, JavaScript, Razor, there's lots of different tools that that uh, become possible, or, you know, I, I tend to be at what, what Patrick just said, uh, use core plant an app and uh, more record by record. So lots of different ways to go, but where, what's your first language? Right. So Patrick, if you find that and you could either, um, if you can get that on the chat, that would be terrific. If not, we'll perhaps follow up with Albert. Uh -huh. Thanks. Well, Thank you, Patrick. Yep. Good question. So I have one little small add-on into that in my Please. solution. Which is I have sort of have a hybrid between what Jim and Patrick said, which is I have a very big nested JSON file that comes in. I use the JSON to entities function to um, pull out uh, objects within within that JSON path and write them to a table. And then I use, I pass that table to uh, SQL to let it actually pull those, all those detail entities apart. Okay. Dale, you uh, muted, I think you were talking. Uh, I was I was cautioning my grandson about making noises. <laughs> there was a good reason for being muted. <laughs> yes, I was. Good. Okay. Um, let's see. I was. Uh, we we might not get past first call today. We'll go right from first call to afterglow. But I was going to mention that. Um, uh, we have some interesting and uh, 
deep developer stuff coming up uh, on the next low code cafe. Um, one of our new uh, full stack developers at Plant and App has been working on uh, a uh, digitally signing files project. And uh, so I, I just want to let people know, you know, sometimes we do these very light and, and necessary no code things. And then, uh, you know, we want to do technical topics, uh, deep technical topics as well. So this, this Wednesday, if that's what you're waiting for, deep technical topic, that'll be a good one. And it's a, it's a really interesting use case. I don't want to steal this thunder, but it's a good use case. And then it opens up uh, another, um, another avenue for how problems can be solved. So I don't know, did I tease that sufficiently? All right, we have four minutes left where we could go right to our unreported session. Any, any last things you wanna ask about today? There are a couple of uh, new items in Campfire if you wanted to display those. Or hey. if you wanna do that in Afterglow. Uh, no, if you've got, if you've got, I hadn't even looked at uh, Campfire, I have to be honest. So let's do that. Are, are you perhaps the contributor, Ben? <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe. All right. His, his name is there a few times. So, campfire.plantandapp.com. If anybody in this, I think everybody in this group is already participating, but uh, communicate with me if you want to be part of this group and get access to the website. And new contributions. Cool stuff as usual. So unlock stuck scheduler job. And read web config. Cool. What do you want to talk about? Which one first? Ben? Well, I, the, the scheduler job part, I know I've heard people mention in these campfires in the past that it's happened to them as well, where you have a job that runs, you know, let's say every 10 minutes or whatever, something happens where it flips out and it doesn't stop running. So it gets stuck in that running mode. So you can't click run now. It always shows as it's running. It won't kick off again because if you've checked off that uh, checkbox that says don't run if running then it won't run again so it's kind of stuck in limbo and then you have to go into the tables to fix it um, so this just basically gives an easy way it's just uh, an action grid with uh, the definition right there so you could just download the the export and then um, add that to your grid uh, into your system and it just gives you a grid with all of your active jobs so the jobs that are not disabled and if it's running, it'll tell you if it's running and then it'll give you when it started and how long it's been running. So if you see something running for two days and it's stuck, you'll just have a button on the side that says force terminate. All it's going to do is it's just going to insert an end date on that lost record. Once that's done, then it unlocks and it becomes, you know, an unrunning job and then it can kick off again on its regular schedule or whatever. Nice. So... I so I, I'm going to ask this as a, as a question. If if um, if you understood your particular job scenario and maximums that a job should run, this could in fact be a automation job that automatically cleans them up and perhaps reports them to you. You, uh, could, you, you could adapt the technique, is what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the code, you could adapt that technique and, well, you could try to turn it into another job and hope that job doesn't uh, in itself get stuck in running mode. But yes, um, you could turn that into a job and, you know, set it up so that you could say if a job is running for more than an hour, automatically terminate it. Or if it's running more than an hour um, to, to check it, to, to send out an email. And oh, right, exactly, exactly. Uh, other kinds of follow up activity. Yep. 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 But, um, you know, this has happened to me now, I think three or four times. Um, I have a website that actually has a lot of jobs and just sometimes one of those jobs just gets kind of lost. It starts and it, it does terminate, but it never stamps the table with the end date. 
So yeah. then the job looks like it's still running. And then because it's running and I have that little checkbox saying, don't run again, if it's running, then it just never kicks off again. So, you know, sometimes I don't even realize it until someone tells me, Hey, um, the report data looks like it hasn't been refreshed in two days. And I look, and I'm like, Oh, it got stuck. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, this is the following is speculation and opinion, the opinion of the host. I, I've spent some time looking for these and I suspect it has to do with when IIS um, refreshes the site, whatever the, you know, there's a, a, a can't remember the terminology, the right terminology, but there's a, there's a uh, time. That, that, yeah. The app pool recycling. Thank you. That's exactly the one. See, you're, you're, you're ahead of me. <laughs> and I think, um, I think it's related to app pool recycling. I've tried to speed that up and, uh, and get something that's very reproducible and I haven't, but it's, um, there's something I think connected in that area. Hopefully. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you because to me, from my perspective, it looks very random. Like I said, it's only happened like maybe three or four times, but it's over the course of like six months. So, yep. and it's not always the same job that it happens to. So I couldn't tell you what kicked it off. I don't know if it's a SQL hiccup that maybe just SQL took too long to return or whatever. I have no clue. All I know is once in a blue moon, a job will just get, you know, kind of stuck in that running mode. And then this was actually, you saw my, uh, my ticket on community, uh, my post the other day. I just, uh, I'm writing something where I need to know um, in this particular case, what the um, URL formatting is, because apparently I have some sites that use advanced, and then I have some sites that use, uh, I forgot what it is, friendly or something friendly, like that. I had written something on a site that used friendly. And then when I copied it to the other site that was using advanced, it bombed on me. So I wanted to try to find a way to read what the setting is so that I can correctly write my URL. And there was no way to do that. So I ended up writing my own and I figured I'd just throw it out there in case anyone else needed to do something similar. Yep. And, um, you know, I suppose that, this points out that um, anything, anything within the web config could be extracted, which um, you know potentially is something you, you may not want to allow this on your system uh, if if you had it, concerns about um, it, it running. Um, but with that caveat, that's a, that's a powerful and useful thing to extract. And it's always, you know, it's it's advanced coding techniques allow that kind of thing. So. Cool. Yeah, and and if security is a concern, like I wrote this initially, I wrote it to pull out just this one piece of information, and then I expanded it so that it took parameters, so it could now read basically anything you need. But if you were to look at this code for this token, you could then reverse engineer it to do what I originally created it to do is just pull out one item. So for argument's sake, if this was the only item you wanted, you can strip out all of the parameters, have it focus strictly on that one item. Yep. And then it's not so much a security risk because no, someone can't read anything else. This is literally just pulling out one specific little item out of the entire web config. Yep, good point. Great. Thanks again for your contributions. All right. Um, with that, I am going to move that we adjourn to Afterglow. And so I am going to thank everyone for showing up. We will stop the recording here. We will see you next week at both Low Code Cafe and then this event again, uh, Low Code Campfire next Friday. Thanks for coming.